Great evening, everybody. This is Pastor James Rawson, and I am excited to have this opportunity to worship with you online. Times have changed. Can you imagine? This is the way we're worshiping God. But you know what? We're not physically together, but spiritually we are absolutely connected. You know why? Because God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. However, I really do miss the gathering. And I can't wait until we get back to gathering. But in the meantime, we're not going to stop that. We're not going to allow that to stop us from praising and worshiping our God. So come on in the sanctuary tonight, Cyber Sanctuary, and let's receive a word for our lives and let's receive, amen, this praise team and worship team as we usher in the presence of the Lord. I'm excited. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody, for he is a worthy God. He is a great God. He's worthy to be praised. He's a great God. And he's worthy of all the glory, worthy of all the honor. Let us pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this opportunity on tonight. Father, we thank you for the gift of your precious Holy Spirit. God, we thank you for allowing us to be here just to give your name praise, just to give your name worship, just to give you glory, just to give you honor. Though all that's going on in the world, God, you are still worthy. And we are here to declare that you are still a great God. And we still have the victory through you in the name of Jesus. We praise you and we thank you. Let your anointing flow through this live, through this recording, through this service in the name of Jesus. We'll praise you and we'll thank you. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Truly, we have the victory. Anybody know that he is the King of Kings? Yeah. Anybody know he's the Lord of Lords? Well, come on and hail Jesus. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Thank you, our online audience, for joining us. Hallelujah. Come on, come on. Hey. song just goes like this. Hail Jesus, you're my king. Your life frees me to sing. And I will praise you all my days. Because you're perfect in all your ways. Everybody say, Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. Obey your word I will obey your because word. I want to see your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Not my will, but yours be done. Yeah, yeah, Jesus, you're my king. Your life frees me to sing. Yeah. And I will praise you all my days. Because you're perfect in all your ways. Say, Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. And I will obey your word. I will obey your word. Because I want to see your kingdom come. See your kingdom come. Not my will, but yours be done. Oh, say glory, glory to the land. Take us into the land, yeah. You will take us into the land. And we will conquer in your name. We'll in your name. And proclaim that Jesus reign. And oh, oh, hell, hell, line of Judah.
thank him for the victory yes, God. we thank him for the victory but this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith yes, so we keep gathering and we keep listening because the more we hear our faith is built because faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of God so father we thank you for this moment we thank you for the opportunity I pray now that you would speak to us in a way that encourages us and strengthens us and makes us ready for what lies ahead. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Right where you are, lift your hands and lift your voices. And let's bless him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Do you know Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Son of God? Have you ever seen him? 
fulfills his favor. His name is Jesus, the Son of God. Singing, oh, sweet wonder. Come on, Zion, wherever you are. Oh, yes, Lord. Sweet wonder. Call his name. Jesus, the Son of God. Woo. Yes, Lord. Oh, how, how I love him. Come on, say it. Oh, how. Yes, Lord. I adore him. Call his name Jesus. The Son of God. He's a wonder in my soul. Come on, say it. He's a wonder in my soul. Whoa, he's a wonder. In my soul, bless his name. Come on, he's a wonder. Yes, Lord, in my soul. Woo. Thank him for the wonder tonight. He's a wonder, my Lord, in my soul. He is, he is a wonder. In my soul, with in me. Now I know, I know, I know this don't sound too modern. And this is not a, this is not a virtual party. And I realize I don't have a DJ and as people are doing nothing wrong with that. And I realize we're not doing that. But before the pandemic and before all of this trouble, the saints put this in us because they understood that if you could sing through these times, if you could sing about who he was, the splendor of God, it would get you through the hard times. And we, long before we, had, we the, the old saints didn't have ham and organs in the house and they didn't have drums and all of that, but they would lift their voices and sing, oh, sweet wonder. Nothing. Right where you are, go ahead and sing it. Oh, Sweet wonder. Call it name, Jesus. The Son. Say it, children. Oh, God. Say it out of your spirit tonight. Sing it. Oh, sweet wonder. My, my, my. Oh, yeah, Lord. Sweet wonder. Call his name Jesus, the Son of God. Yes, woo, yes, come on, yes, woo, yes, my, 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 yes. all of our brothers and sisters in the church of God in Christ so many of the generals and the mothers have fallen asleep there's so many who are struggling with the will and the decisions of God tonight our hearts are turned towards you and we want you to know that we're praying with you and praying for you but the servant your servant dad Mason Bishop Mason put a song in the spirit of the church that for this times we would acquiesce to the will of God and say yes Lord come on come on yes Woo! when I don't understand it yes Lord oh yes 
Yes, Lord. Woo! Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Thy will. Come on, say it. Thy will. Come on. Thy will. Say it out your belly. Thy will. Thy will. We say yes to his will. Say yes to his way. When his spirit speaks to us with our whole heart, we'll obey. And our answer will be yes. Our answer will be yes. Come on. Our answer will be yes. Come on. Even when I don't understand, it's still yes. Hallelujah. So we bless him tonight. Let's look into the word of the Lord. Let's get back to the word of the Lord. Thank you, praise and worship ministry. Thank you for serving so powerfully and reminding us of the greatness of our God. We hail him as the king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so at the end of the day, I believe that God is showing us, I believe that God is showing us that even through this pandemic, y'all took me out of my place took me out of my place and you reduced me to being one of you but I am the king of kings I am the lord of lords I'm not a president I'm the president of the presidents I am the supreme ruler I am God and beside me there is no other so we bless him tonight Um, let's continue our lesson as it relates to the seven churches that God has given us to discuss seven churches of Asia Minor. And this is a message to the saints. This is a love letter. These are love letters that God wrote to all of the churches. And though they are addressed to seven distinct churches, the contents of the letter are for all churches. And it's amazing because the word of the Lord is such a timeless truth, even in that, even now, what's written all of those years, aforetime, are relevant and relative to where we are now. And it speaks to the characteristics of the church even now. And so we started teaching on a Sunday and my intent was, my intent was to teach it and to communicate it in such a way that it would be quite informative and that inspirational bug hit me and we got to preaching. And, uh, and of course it's one and the same, so I treat I preach. I don't call myself preaching or teaching, but I think I have figured out a way to treat, or that's what I try to do. So I want to treat a little bit tonight about the second uh, part of the letter to the church at Smyrna. And we understand that Smyrna was a relatively small or rather large city. It was a place that was inundated with religious thought and anti-Christian. It was anti-Christian. It was not a it was not a town that was pro-Christian. And as a result, the behavior toward Christians was quite um, disparaging. Uh, it was quite afflicting, and it caused them a lot of pain and tribulation because the church at Smyrna, though it was small in number. Uh, it was rich in spirituality. The church at Smyrna was rich in spirituality, and though they were not economically a force, spiritually they were a force. And I think that uh, the point that I think that, that might be taken here is that sometimes I think we have traded spiritual power for economic power. and We would rather be known as people with a lot of money and influence and we like to be seen and we like uh, to be considered among the who's who. But when we scale the church and peel the church back at its core, we were supposed to be spiritual. The church was not supposed to be doing all of those other things. The church should be and should always be uh, priority to the church is in fact its spiritual uh, prowess. We ought to be the spiritual consciousness of the community. 
We ought to be the spirituality. We, we ought to be the place where people say, what is God saying about this? And so it is important, even in this time that we're living in, in this season, we're trying to get through the COVID-19 and trying to understand uh, the, the effects of this coronavirus. What is God saying? And the church must be the place that we are seeking for a sure word from God to give direction to this situation. Not just being on social media uh, to put our cash apps up. I'm not scared of any of y'all. Put our cash apps up to, to say a whole bunch of things that causes people to give, causes people to have a, put attention on us. And so from one prophet to another, this one is saying this one. There are those who have already said it'll be over by Easter and it'll be over by the day before. And, and, then, and, and, and it's amazing how the dates keep changing. It's amazing to me how you have a sure word of prophecy from the Lord, but your dates keep changing. Um, uh, <laughs> there's a difference. I'm not going to get into that tonight because that's not really my lesson. But it's amazing to me. It would be better for us as a church, as a church body, is to stay in a place of faith and prayer and say, God, like Jehoshaphat, say, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I will tell you this, though. If the Bible is right, this is the beginning of sorrows. If the Bible is right, he didn't say that this would let up, but he said when we will start seeing these things, he tells us in the scripture, uh, Matthew 25, to look up for our redemption so I think that the message to the saints is, in, uh, is embodied in a song that I think James Cleveland made popular, Get Right Church, and let's go home. So the church at Smyrna was a church that was under great pressure. They was under great affliction. They were great, under great tribulation. They were severely troubled. But you know what's interesting about the church at Smyrna? They got used to it. They understood that this was a suffering way, and they were not complaining. As a matter of fact, when the Lord begins to talk to them, he has no rebuke, he has no correction for them, because they seem to understand that all they that would live godly shall suffer persecution. And it looks as if they understood that if I'm going to name the name of Jesus Christ, then number one, I'm not going to be popular. Number two, mm, this may be a dangerous way. You know, the reality is, until uh, recently, we have not really seen danger in the church in the United States. But there are those countries that literally together will cost them their lives. Scripture says, you have not resisted under blood, striving against sin. You, we don't know, we don't, really don't know persecution. We we, we think a little discomfort and a, a, a little things that's going on now. Oh, my God. This is the most we have ever seen in recent history. None of us alive have ever seen this level of persecution against the church. We've seen it against the African Americans. Yes, we have. We've seen it against different particular ethnic groups, but not against the church. The church is being challenged. And so God is saying through his letter here at Smyrna, that seem as if the people of Smyrna, the church at Smyrna understood that this is the kind of way. This goes with it. He says, I know your works. He says, I know your affliction. Then he says, I know your poverty. I know that you don't have, but meek, you're getting along on meager fare. And you know, I want to say something uh, that it seems as if the saints seem to suffer the most economically. Have you ever noticed it seems like the saints seem to have less. And, uh, but if we're not careful, we will spend our time bemoaning our faith and talking about how little we have instead of flipping that same coin over and realizing that with little, God still provides. With less, we still have more. I wish I had a witness anywhere in, this, in, in, in the world that would say that you know what I'm talking about how God can take a little bit and other people are wrestling with thousands and, and, and tens of thousands of dollars and you don't even know what a thousand dollars look like but somehow God keeps food on your table. Somehow God keeps a roof over your head. 
Isn't this amazing that even when I don't have what well, other rich people are wrestling and grappling with, oh my God, uh, my life is coming to an end. There are those of us who have learned how to get along on meager fare. The old hymn writer wrote the song and said, if this earth, this, this earth from you withhold all of its silver and its gold, and you have to get along on meager fare, just remember in his word, how he feeds the little bird. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. But my God whoo, shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. And so while we seem to suffer, the saints here in Smyrna seem to suffer, but they thrived on spiritual wealth. I want to say that even in this season, this is a great time for you to recommit yourself to God and reconnect to God and get closer to God. Draw nigh to him and he'll draw nigh to you. Listen, listen, uh, things are closed and we can't do what we used to do. Um, and I know alternative behaviors seem to be attractive. Some of us are eating ourselves into a frenzy. Oh boy, I, I don't think I want to talk about that. I guess don't. I, I mean, you're, you're finding, I mean, I don't become a handyman. I'm looking for stuff in Lowe's to put together, buy and fix and, and all that kind of stuff. I'll be looking. I mean, I just ain't got nothing else to do. And then it hit me. I need to spend some time making sure my relationship with God is stronger. Could, could it be that God is using this time to make sure that our prayer life is really what it should be. It's amazing, it's amazing to me how much time we don't have when things are normal. And now all of a sudden we have time, and then now we have time, but we don't have the energy or the focus for it, which tells me that it's not an issue of time, it's a matter of discipline. I pray that God would give us a discipline. That we would say, at this time I will seek the Lord. At this time I'm going to read his word. At this time I'm going to spend my time engaging in the things that help me grow spiritually so I can become spiritually wealthy. Because I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. Our only hope is in the name of the Lord. Our hope is in the name of the Lord. Our hope must be and the one in the name of he who rose from the dead and dieth no more. Our hope must be in the name of the Lord. Verse 10, notice what verse 10 says. He says, uh, let's get back to it. Verse 10 said, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He says, he says, do not fear. Why would God say to the church of Smyrna, do not fear? Because he knew that fear, or rather suffering, was inevitable. I wish I could tell you something different, but the reality is there's no way around it. All of us are going to have to suffer sometimes. We have to suffer things that we don't, and none of us choose. We don't get to choose. We don't pick our poison. We don't get to choose what we suffer and what we don't suffer. The reality is that suffering is inevitable. Persecution will come. If you name the name of Jesus Christ, persecution is going to come. And persecution is not, hear this, persecution is not somebody rolling their eyes at you. Mm -mm. I wish that was all it was. I would have no problem because I don't care about nobody rolling their eyes. That, that, that don't hurt you. That, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, that don't really change your life. It don't change your, it don't change your bottom line. It don't change nothing. But persecution is not just a merely somebody having a difference of opinion about who you are. Persecution is when, when things and people rise up and set systems in place to hurt you. Persecution. Persecution is systemic evil. It is when there is a plan and a plot to hurt you, a plan and a plot to bring, to burden you down. Persecution is severe trouble. It is when burdens come and, and there is a plan to destroy you. Persecution. Persecution. Persecution is severe. And um, he said, Jesus said in the letter, he said, some of you will be thrown into prison. I never thought I would live in a time 
where pastors would be arrested for trying to share the gospel. We're living in a day that none of us saw coming and we could not even imagine that for preaching the good news. You know, we read the Bible, I read the Bible, and um, I'm going to be honest, sometimes you read it and sometimes you can read it so much till you skip over the magnitude of what was really going on. Do you know that in the book of Acts, Peter was in prison because he said the name Jesus? Because they told him, said, now you can do anything you want, but just don't use that name. You can preach, you can heal, you can do anything, but don't call that name. He said, we, I, can't, I can't preach what I don't know and what I don't believe. I, 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 can't, I can't use another name. Neither is there salvation in any other name. And because he used the name Jesus, the Bible says he was thrown in prison. I don't know how y'all feel about it, but um, I ain't really built for prison. I can't imagine uh, being in prison and let alone for preaching the gospel. And so when we read it, sometimes it almost reads like a good novel. But now we're in 2020. In the, in, we're in the fourth month, but in the third month, month or, or the third or fourth month, month of this year, men and women of God are arrested for preaching the word of God. <sighs> what have we come to? We've come to We've come to the prophetic expression. We've come to the prophetic manifestation of what has been written here in the book of Revelation, chapter number 2. Some of you will be thrown in prison, and others of you will suffer tribulation for 10 days, and uh, that you may be tried. The crisis, this crisis, let me tell you what God told me, and I, and I want to share with you. He said, this crisis, is testing the authenticity of your faith. You know what this is about? This is about you discovering and the Lord discovering, as if he didn't know, who's really real. Nah. This will cause you to know whether you really believe God or whether you just jive. This crisis, he says, I'm sending this so I'm sending this, to, this is to test you, to try you. You know what it is doing? It is testing the metal of the church. He says, I'm using this to see who really, are you going to really believe this or are you just going to talk it? Is your relationship with God so shallow that you need a building? Are you only walking with God for the fish and the loaves? Does your relationship with God extend only when there is church time? Is this something you put on like a suit or a dress? And when it's over, you change your clothes? Is, is, this, is this a real relationship or is it just religion? Because you do know there's a difference between religion and relationships. You do know that there is a huge difference and people uh, oftentimes trying to make the two be the same. But there is a difference between having a relationship with Jesus and just doing things religiously. You drink coffee, don't you? Religiously, every day, whatever times you do it. It's a religion. You do it consistently. But that's not salvific. It's not sal it has nothing to do with your soul. But a relationship with Jesus is the kind of relationship that Austin Miles talks about in his, in his wonderful hymn, he says, and he walks with me. And he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own and the joy we share as we tarry there. None other has ever known its relationship. This is trying us. Church, this God is qualifying the church. God is qualifying the church. God is finding out who's real and who's he said, y'all been trying to judge folk forever and you faulty and you, you, you can't come up with the right answer because you don't know. Man he looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. But God says, I'm going to send something. I am sending something that will cause who's real to be separated from the counterfeit. That's why he said, let the wheat and tear grow together. It ain't 
ain't your job to separate nobody. It ain't your job to determine who's right and who's wrong. Let the wheat and tear grow together because at the time of separation, I will separate them. Could it be that God is sending this level of persecution because we have been trying to do his job? Maybe we've been doing his job. Maybe we've been spending too much time trying to do his job. This one's right. This one's wrong. This one doing that. That one doing the other. Could it be that God is saying, that ain't your job. Your job is to live for me yourself. Your job is to develop a relationship with me for yourself. Your job is to get close to me for yourself. And now we're in a situation where it really don't matter what my brother's doing, my sister doing. It don't matter what nobody's doing because the reality is if he cracks the sky tonight, what they are doing ain't going to matter to my destiny. If I die and my soul be lost, hey, yes, Lord, nobody's fault. You don't have a friend that can talk up for you. You don't have a family member. You don't have a parent that can speak up for you to get you in where you have not developed a relationship. He says you're going to be in this tribulation, some of you, for 10 days. And there is a whole lot of theological speculation as to what that would mean. Uh, because a thousand years with the Lord is as one day and one day is as a thousand years. And so we could sit here and uh, theologically debate. Uh, what that 10 days and why uh, uh, is the scripture specific to say 10 days? What does that mean? Uh, does it mean some scholars say that it means the 10, 10 kings or 10 emperors, as it were, because Smyrna was under the rule of Rome. And so uh, there were those that would suggest that he was suggesting that, would they, that this tribulation would last 10 emperors, 10, the reign of 10 emperors. There were others that would suggest that it was uh, 10,000 years. Others that would suggest uh, 10 years, 20 years. I mean, a whole lot of speculation. But what I have come up with and what I have discovered about this text as I've been meditating on it is the fact that he would call it 10 days says to me that whatever this tribulation is, is going to be limited. I feel like shouting. I feel like shouting because what that told me was that if Jesus was to say in a letter, you're going to have tribulation for 10 days, which means then it's not going to be 9 days and it's not going to be 11 days. It's not going to go on and on and on. Jesus is saying there is a limit. This trouble has an expiration date. Lord, I wish I was talking to the right people. And I want to tell somebody who's listening under the sound of my voice that your trouble has an expiration date. Mm, there's only one good thing about trouble. Yes, Lord, I praise you. And that one thing is that trouble don't last all. <laughs> the good thing about trouble is that when God decides that your trouble is ended, there's not a demon anywhere that can subvert, that can avert, that can change his decision when God says you are over, when God says it's over, when God says you're coming out, Nothing can stop you from having your moment of deliverance. And so God says to the church at Smyrna, you're going to have tribulation for 10 days. Notice what he says then. He says, be thou faithful unto death. He says, be thou faithful unto death. Now this is what he did not say. He did not say, be thou faithful uh, till you die. Or, or rather, be thou faithful because you're going to die. What he was saying is, be thou faithful unto death. Unto the moment where you have to leave. And all of us got different departure dates. All of us, none of us are all leaving at the same time. God has strategically timed it so that none of us will leave at the same time. He says, but I want you to stuck, stick in your spirit. I'm going to be faithful. I'm determined, the old saints used to sing when I was coming up in the church, when we had devotional service, they would say, I'm determined to walk with Jesus. Oh, yes, I am. They would say, I'm determined to walk with Jesus. Yes, I am. Through hard trials and tribulations, persecutions, I'll be faithful. I'm determined to walk with Jesus. Oh, yes, I am. And this is what it's going to take in this hour. You must have a double determination that I'm going to be faithful to 
until death. I'm going to be faithful unto death. So even if it costs my life, the one thing that you ought to make up in your mind is if I go out tonight, I want my epitaph to read, he was faithful. I don't even want anybody to talk about gifts and it doesn't matter, talents, it doesn't really matter um, what I look like, it don't matter how much money I have, uh, my family uh, uh, see that all of that. Thank you, Jesus. But that, 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 that's really not what I want to leave on record. What I want to leave on record, what I hope to leave on record is that he was faithful. Because I'm going to tell you something. There is a reward for the faithful. I believe with all my heart there is something about being faithful to God that pays dividends that nothing else will. The Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. Listen, when you are faithful to God, even when you miss the mark, when you don't cross all the T's and when you don't dot all the I's, when you are committed to God, when you are in a committed relationship with Jesus Christ, when you are faithful to his house and faithful to the thing that he's called you to do, let me tell you something. There's a grace on the faithful. I said there's a grace on the faithful. There is something about being faithful to God that somehow he makes sure that you are always taken care of. Mm. But Lord, I messed up here, but you remember I walked with you. And uh, when other people would not walk, I, I remained. I, I, I stayed. That's why I tell people all the time, I don't care what kind of condition you're in, uh, uh, a weak saint or a strong saint, stay a saint. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, stay a saint. I, I don't care what condition you're in, don't ever leave the ark of safety. Stay, remain in the fellowship, remain in covenant with God, and remain in the company of the believers. You know why? Because there is something that you get by being connected. There is something that when you have no personal motivation, if you're in the right company, they will push you, they will pull you, they will carry you. Do I have a witness anywhere? When you are in the right company, you got somebody praying for you and covering you and watching for your soul. There is something special about being faithful and loyal to God. When you are faithful, when you are faithful to God, here's the promise, here's the promise. He said, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown. Y'all see it in your Bibles? I will give you a crown of life. I'll give you a crown. I'll give you a crown. And at this time, and in, ancient, uh, in, ancient, in the ancient world, uh, uh, two people, there were two types of crowns because there was one crown um, of leaves, or rather, uh, uh, yeah, a golden leaves that the royalty would wear as they parade themselves around. And then there was another crown. It was called the Stephanos. The Stephanos. The Stephanos was a crown of um, uh, leaves that, that would go to the athletes that would win. And so when the athletes would win their race or win their, um, their, their uh, the event, they would, be, they would be placed on them a crown. And they would parade uh, around as the conqueror, as the winner, as the winning athlete. Um, and that was important to that culture because the crown uh, identified those who have won. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says to the church at Smyrna, if you be faithful unto death, I will give you a crown of life. Lord, I praise you for that. Ah, why, why is that so critical? Why is that important? Because this crown is different from the fading crown. Because the athlete's crown, after a while, the leaves turn brown. After a while, the, the crown that the athletes wear uh, are wilted and they are no longer, they no longer have their consistency or the constitution where they can remain on their head. But the crown of life is a crown that does not fade. Hallelujah. The crown of life is a crown that will never wear out. The crown of life will never lose its shine. It will never lose its luster. The crown of life is only given to people who have decided and determined that while I'm going through persecution. And while I'm going through this hard time, I am determined to walk with Jesus. Yes, I am. Through hard trial and tribulation, persecution, I'm going to be faithful. And if I, if you, brothers and sisters, if you are faithful unto death, he's going to give you a crown that won't 
fade away. Hallelujah. That's why Paul, in his, uh, in his um, departing speech as, as the valedictorian uh, of, uh, uh, of his apostleship, he leaves on record and he says, brothers, I am now ready. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. I have, um, I have endured. I have done all of that. And uh, henceforth now there is laid up for me a crown, yes, Lord, of righteousness, whom the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. But not only just to me, I'm not the only one with a crown. I'm not the only one that can get this crown, but to all those who love his appearing. In other words, my brothers and sisters, there's a crown sitting on the shelf of glory that is tailor-made just for you. Thank you, Jesus. It is tailored for you. It is tailored. It's not a seven and five eighths. It's not a seven and three quarter. It is made just for your head because your head carries the experiences of your life. You know where you've been persecuted. God knows how many times you've gone through. God knows what you have suffered through. And he says, I got a crown that is specially made for you and when it's all over we shall wear a crown we sing that song we sing that song and it becomes a funeral song but the truth is when the battle is over we shall wear a crown in the new Jerusalem but before the new Jerusalem and I can I can debate the theology of that song all day and I and I don't want to do that but I, what I will tell you this if you be faithful unto He's got a crown of life. He's going to crown us with life. He's going to crown us with life. And when this is over, he's going to make sure, he's going to make sure that if you have been faithful, there is a reward for the faithful. There is a reward for There's a reward. I know your works, your affliction. I know your trouble. I know your poverty. I know your poverty. I know, but there's a reward coming. There's a reward coming. I know you've been persecuted, but there's a reward coming. I know that you've been ostracized. I know this is a trying time. I know this is a rough time. But there's a reward coming. Mm -hmm. Peter said to Jesus, he said, um, Lord, we have given up everything to follow you. Jesus said, Peter, I'm not impressed. I'm not nervous about that. Let me tell you this. No man give, has given up mother, father, houses and land, things, that I will not in this life and the life to come give them a hundredfold. In other words, whatever you've given to God, whatever you've sacrificed, please know that he's got a reward waiting on you. There's a reward waiting. I will remember your labor will not be in vain. I will remember. And a reward awaits in your name. I want you to know tonight that wherever you are under the sound of my voice, please know, please ma'am, please sir, if you love the Lord and you're going through persecution, this persecution is pushing you into purpose and you are going to receive the crown of life. Just be faithful and not fearful. I know this is a scary time, but choose faith over faith. Father, I thank you right now for every heart. I thank you for the opportunity to encourage and to speak to your people. Lord, is there anybody under the, if there's anybody under the sound of my voice that doesn't know you in the free pardon of your, their sin, I pray that you would allow this word to challenge them and, and prompt them to say, to ask the question, what must I do to be saved? I don't understand all about you, God, but I don't want a religion. I want relationships come into my heart. Help me, Lord, to follow you in everything that I do. Bless and strengthen your people everywhere. 
Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you're making a decision to walk with Jesus tonight, if you're making a decision to walk with the Lord, this is what I want you to do. I want you to type in your name and your information or inbox us. We will, we will get right back to you. We want to know. We want to connect with you. We want to know. And we want you to know that somebody's praying for you and that we are with you in the name of the Lord. Now, listen, let's take advantage of the opportunity to prosper. I want you right now to get a tangible seed in your, in your possession. Uh, I, I would say in your hand, but that's just because we just used to saying that in church. But uh, you don't need to get it in your hand. Just get it on your device through realm.org, through klmnation.org. You can give. Uh, certainly through Givelify, Cash App, um, uh, Dollar Sign, KLM Nation. You can go through all of these ways. Or you can meet someone here. Someone here will be here on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 5 to 6. And um, uh, sow a seed. If this ministry has touched you, if this, if, this, if this word is a blessing to your life, feed what's, feed, what's, what's feeding you. It is my prayer that you've been blessed tonight. It is my prayer and my desire that you will, like I will, ask the Lord, help me to follow you.